Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to Session Fartook-100. The last episode featured the party being cleared as murderers by the son of the slain tribal chieftain. Investigator Rockfist had asked permission for the centaur boy named Fargus to be allowed to wander through the city to see if he could spot the suspect. His mother, Felina, had reluctantly agreed and the dwarf had made arrangements for a group of five armed centaurs to accompany the group to keep him safe. We rejoin the group as they listen to Rockfist and the watch commander give orders to the guards. Seal the gates after the five are allowed to enter and form up on the plaza, ordered the watch commander. Rockfist was attempting to form up groups that could go door to door and pull out every male to be identified. A clatter was rising from the stable area and Karina immediately knew what the cause of it was. She moved to the commander who was supervising the closing of the gate and asked if she could remove peepers from his stall so she could watch over the future leader of the centaur clan. With a flurry of activity, the commander just waved her off, pointing out that he had bigger issues to contend with. Karina quickly went to retrieve her axe beak and rejoined the group mounted on her. As she approached the heavily armed centaurs, they formed a protective ring around their young liege, but he requested that they move aside. He slowly approached the human and her mount and looked at them in amazement. May, uh, may I speak with your mount? Nodding happily, the waif extended an open hand. The adult centaurs continued to look around to make sure the boy was safe, and he began to communicate with the large bird. The chirping went back and forth as Peeper seemed to be enjoying the conversation, and Karina was picking up on a few of the words. Rockfist had assembled six groups with five guards in each group and dispatched them down the street. Order every able-bodied man into the street so that they may be identified. If they resist, if they resist, explain it to them, she said flatly. The guards gave salutes and headed down the main drag to do her bidding. The watch commander joined her and the rest of the party along with Felina. The gate guards report no one has come up or gone since the lone rider left last night. I'm not sure the killer is going to be among us. The female centaur looked displeased but softened as the commander added that it would not stop them from looking everywhere. Fargus Stoutheart noticed that Karina and the young Fargus seemed to have hit it off. He pointed out that they, the adventurers, were not pos permitted to possess weapons and that her son was safe with the waif. She looked back and appeared to be appeased that the pair were having a lively conversation with Peepers chirping in as well. The group started down the street and Sister Elaine asked the question. Permission to speak with you, um, my, uh, my lady? My centaur? My, um, uh, stuttered the cleric. Felina grinned at the faux pas and looked at Rockfist, who nodded confidently. You may call me Felina, Reverend Daughter. It will make us both feel at ease. The cleric thanked her and asked if she knew of a description of the person they were looking for. The centaur woman explained that her son had given a basic description of the intruder, but had not had much experience with humans yet. Felina pointed out that they all looked the same to centaurs, which caused Bulger to laugh loudly. <laughs> I know the feeling, lady! Felina brushed off the brashness of the former sailor, but her guard was not so forgiving and pushed ahead, getting between her and the gnome. There was one thing my son mentioned about the assailant, she said. He pointed out that he had paint on his upper arm. The group pondered the strange comment and discussed it as the procession made its way down the street. After several guesses, the group felt that the boy must have meant a tattoo. Cabe Silvertongue snapped his fingers and ran back to the cadre of guards escorting the young centaur. His rapid approach caused the guards to burst forth and hold the half-elf back. Struggling, the bard yelled to the boy, The paint! The paint, son! Was it a blade? Through a heart? Your mother said you saw paint on the man. Was it here? Pointing to his chest. The guards continued to hold the bard back, and a shout was heard ahead of the main group, and a guard exited the inn where Hagrid had been found slain. 
The watch commander and Rockfist ran forward while Fargus and the others stopped in their tracks. Sister Elaine began to mutter that apparently Meebles was causing a problem, and she wasn't surprised. A flurry of guards ran towards the building and a tumult was heard. Fargus started forward but stopped, allowing the guards to do their jobs as they were unarmored. Cabe returned to the head of the column out of breath. Greycloak! <laughs> Sir, Sir Magret! I, I, I think he's the killer! The others looked at the half-elf who was sweating profusely and out of breath. A moment later he explained, The pain is a tattoo. Sir Maggard has the same tattoo that the boy described. I confirmed it. I think he's the one. Lady Irena quickly pointed out that he was seen fleeing the fort but had not yet returned. A painful scream was heard from the inn and a window on the second floor was smashed out and a subject wearing a guard tabard rolled off the roof and landed on a hitching post outside, impaling him instantly. Another figure in dark clothes crashed through the window and was parrying several swords that were coming out of the open window. The group gasped as they recognized Sir Maggart, and a yell from behind him was the young centaur yelling that that was the suspect who threatened his life. A second window on the floor was smashed out and a pair of guards gingerly made their way out onto the rooftop ledge. Young Fargus began to charge forward, yelling, You killed my father! but was quickly outpaced by the stunned guards. Karina smacked peepers and the two launched forward in an effort to protect the young leader. Sir Maggard stabbed another guard, but the other pair were closing in quickly. Investigator Rockfist jumped over the dead guard on the roof and lumbered towards the unarmed knight who jumped off the roof and landed poorly, breaking his leg in the process. Fargus and the rest of the party raced forward as the centaur guard moved to protect Felina. As the group closed in, the Grey Cloak looked up with a sneer. Seeing no escape, he pulled out a hand crossbow from his belt and quickly loaded a quarrel. Spotting Cabe closing in fast with his elven speed, a nasty grin crossed his face as he lined up the shot and pulled the trigger. Cabe's elven heritage allowed him to drop under the bolt as it sailed over his head. Rolling and making a leap in midair, he sent a haymaker punch right to the knight's face as Rockfist, jumping off the roof, buried her saber into the man's back. The double strike was more than enough to take the knight down, but a shrieking from peepers towered over the clamor. Sir Maggart lay in the middle of the street with his blood gushing from the dwarf's wound. But as Cabe spun around at the noise, he noticed another figure down, blood filling the street as he raised his fists and yelled no. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.